Today has been a pretty cool day. I just got to talk to Dr. Stephen Hayes, who, I don't know, if you, if you follow my work for a while, you know that I really love um, a school of psychological thought called contextual behaviorism, and that I function out of things like relational frame theory and acceptance and commitment therapy. So those are like the genres of psychology that I function in. All my content is really kind of geared within that behavioral lens. And so Dr. Stephen Hayes, he's the founder and the creator of this entire system of psychology that I've studied in and that I use in clinical work. And so he's the leading voice in acceptance and commitment therapy, relational frame theory, and contextual behavior science. He's the guy. He's the guy who started it all. And now it's this huge movement. It's thousands of people all around the planet who are researching and adding to kind of this wealth of information within contextual behaviorism. But this is uh, the guy who started it all. He was a direct uh, pupil of B.F. Skinner, if you've heard of that guy. He's um, really, I think, taken behaviorism into the current modern era. And so um, I was pretty nervous to talk to him because I just revere him so much. And, and I told him this at the end of the interview. It was just funny. Like, it took me maybe, I don't know, like, 30 minutes to kind of warm up and to feel kind of comfortable, like engaging in conversation. And, and, uh, it, it felt a lot more fluid once I warmed up because I don't know, you're just, you're talking to the master, right? And so you don't want to say something silly. And so, but I think, and, and you'll see this in the episode, uh, Steve Hayes is so warm and, um, I don't know. He, I don't think he's aware of what a big deal he is in, <laughs> in, in the best possible way. And he, he seems really genuinely kind and inviting. And so I think that put me at a lot of ease. And what you'll notice in the episode, too, is we kind of start a lot of different conversations in the beginning, first 30, 45 minutes. We, we kind of touch on a bunch of different things and jump around in a lot of different places. And then kind of 30, 45 minutes in, we start to actually kind of tie up some loose ends and kind of come full circle into stuff. So if the first like 30, 40 minutes kind of feel a little bit detached, I'm not talking a lot. It, it feels like we're kind of touching on a lot of different topics. Like that's, that was kind of how it was. And then we really kind of hit our stride, I think like halfway through. Cause um, yeah, I don't know. That's how spontaneous conversations happen, right? It's like, we didn't have like a script. We didn't have points that we were going to try to hit along the way. We literally just like got on the zoom call, pressed record and saw what happened. And I think it was an incredibly meaningful conversation. Like, there was moments that I, I, how do I describe it? It's one thing reading in books. It's another thing seeing someone talk about the ideas that have really formed them and, and share them with you in person. And, well, over Zoom, but, but like, see, maybe seeing the ideas incarnate, that, that's, that, that's a powerful thing. It's one thing to encounter ideas on a page. It's another to hear someone's voice and see their body language and, and see how meaningful it is to them as they describe it. And that, I think, was the most profound thing I walked away from was these ideas have been so impactful for me personally and professionally, but then to see how meaningful they were to him and then to get to interface with that directly was just a privilege. And, uh, and something profound. So I'm really excited to share this episode with you. I hope you love it as much as I did. And uh, all right, here we go. Roll camera. Dr. Stephen Hayes, I'm so happy to have you here. Thank you for taking time to speak with me. This is a real treat. Yeah, well, it's awesome. It's snowing like crazy outside. I'm here just looking forward to it. It's snowing in Nevada right now? It is, it is. Oh my goodness. So well, it's snowing here in Spokane feeling, too. But... <laughs> well, um, I'll tell you, I, uh, you know, it's 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 going to be an interesting conversation because I've I've followed your work for several years since I was in school and and have just found your, particularly your conversation around suffering, and how to alleviate suffering, how to move towards what's meaningful, really, really compelling. Yeah. And it shaped maybe not just like my professional life, but so much of just my personal life. And sure. and uh, and so I'm just so thankful. I think just even personally and just you know, as, as humans right here across, you know, the screen, uh, to, to speak with you, this is a real treat. Yeah. Awesome. Looking forward to it. Yeah. Well, you know, so I, uh, TikTok's kind of funny, um, just as far as how the audience maybe found me. Do you know, do you know what TikTok is? No, I know. What it is, <laughs> yeah, I've, I've never even, come on, come on. I know. I don't want to, you, you got more important things to do than be scrolling through TikTok, but, <laughs> um, TikTok essentially is, the algorithm is built kind of in an interesting way where if people engage with the content, if people watch the videos, then the algorithm gives the video to more people. And then, and it's trying to find people that are similar to the people that just watched it. 
and then kind of it, it progresses and kind of spreads outwards. And so what's interesting about that is that it's not necessarily word of mouth where you have particular demographics that yeah. your audience is kind of built up. It's, it's really spread out. And so I get messages from people all over the world from lots of different cultures and lots of different socioeconomic situations. And, and like, I I've gotten messages just this week from a few people in like the middle East who are gay and trying to figure out how do I live my yeah. sexual identity, but, but knowing that my yeah. parents might try to kill me, like, yeah. um, you know, I've, I've talked to people in the oil fields of Alberta that are uh, just lonely and, and, and feeling like they're just like waking up and they're working and everyone around them is using substances and, and not really knowing how to navigate that. I talked to people here in the United States who are going through affairs um, and hardships, you know, like accustomed to maybe just living in the American life of feeling lonely and, and kind of trapped in social media and not really knowing how to form really meaningful relationships around them. Sure. Uh, just feeling kind of transient moving around. It's, it's people in India and Brazil. So it, there's just so many different kinds of um, maybe stories of suffering that, that I've come into contact through just through kind of a unique platform um, that really wasn't meant for psychological videos. It was kind of, I think, just meant for people dancing and singing songs and being kind of <laughs> silly. <laughs> and, and then I showed up talking about suffering and for some reason, people found that appealing. And um, well, you, you know, I mean, su suffering's ubiquitous in what you're seeing is it's a human thing. And it's not a it's not a one out of five thing. It's a five out of five thing. I mean, we, we all have times where we struggle and if, if anybody didn't know that, I mean, this year of COVID, I mean, 2020 is really just put it in your face, hasn't it? Yeah. I mean, do you know anybody who's just like happy, happy, joy, joy, you know, rim and stinky, everything's fine. It just doesn't exist. It's not, you know, we're, there's times where we're doing well and happy and all that, but we have within us the capacity uh, to run into cul-de-sacs and uh, not know how to get out. And it, yeah doesn't matter whether or not you're in an oil field or, mm. or or in the Middle East or wherever, it's not defined that way. It's being human. Yeah. Well, and I think that's maybe what, you know, as a testimony to your work, as I recapitulate a lot of these ideas, maybe synthesized to my own personality and experience, I've just watched them be so meaningful to people in so many different kinds of stories of, of suffering. And well, there, you know, you're talking to a geeky scientist type. I mean, there, the data just keep coming in, coming in, coming in. I mean, we're talking about four or 5,000 studies. I mean, a huge body of work that says that some of these processes that I've known for targeting are inside all of these different forms mm. of cul-de-sacs, all in many different ways. And conversely, they're related to moving forward in a positive way, whether it's high performance or sports or dealing with cancer or your girlfriend dumped you or, or you know, you're, you're gay and somebody's, your parents are going to like, want to kill you. I mean, or depression, anxiety. I mean, you just go through the list. Stigma, prejudice, to go through the list. It turns out the number of ways that we know how to mess ourselves up formally or the number of ways forward Formally, are many, many, but then the processes under underneath them are few. Mm -hmm. So the cool thing about that, one of the great things that Western science can do is it can filter out and dig it down to an essence. You know, like e equals mc squared. Not that I'm claiming this <laughs> yeah, at yeah. that level, but you know, yeah. everybody knows it, and it applies to an insane number of things. Mm -hmm. We need that in psychology because you know we can get confused and not know what to focus on and when you do know what to focus on you know you can do better you can learn from your mistakes you know why it didn't work and you know why it did work and mm. that's an enormous uh help mm. not like this i'm fixed i'm cured it's not like that you're not broken you're, you're not a disease you're not a walking mm. step from your human being but more like okay now I'm empowered to take a journey that I really want to take, that I really care about, that lifts me up, that makes me wow. more living. Mm. Well, can you tell me more about that? So what do you, because you've been doing this for decades, studying yes. human suffering and human prosperity, trying to find those maybe yes. essential kind of core of what it looks like to experience suffering. I mean, this might be a really general question <laughs> because this has been your whole career, but what, what have been some of the insights maybe that you've gathered? What is like maybe your approach to suffering and what are the essential core elements like you were just well when you dig down to them using western science which is what i've done you find 
at its bedrock lots of things that sound like they're almost off of uh, you know hallmark cards i mean you find things that are so much in our culture when you know to look for them you realize there are no wisdom traditions or spiritual traditions the best parts of our cultural traditions it's not like you know we haven't known something about how to be human for the however many uh, hundreds of thousands of years that have been humans but it's what's what science can do is filter out some of it and so really there's six basic processes that make a difference and there's a flip side you can do it negatively you can do it positively to say it positively you need to learn how to open up to your emotions and think your thoughts without getting all entangled with them or avoiding of them you need to know how to show up here in the present moment, which is where action happens, and do it consciously and allocate your attention to what's of importance. You need to know about what you really want to be about, what you want to stand for, what you want to represent, what you want to reflect in your life, and you need to build your habits around that. That's it. There's six things inside there. If you want to distill it down, you can say it in three. You need to learn how to be more open be more aware, be more actively engaged. If you want just a couple of words, you can say you need to learn how to be more psychologically flexible, which mm. means having the strength and flexibility, just of, it's a, you know metaphorically, just like physical issues. Everybody knows we need to work on our strength and flexibility physically mm. if we want to be uh, you know prepared for the physical challenges of life. You don't wait till you get an injury to do that. You don't wait until you get cancer to do that you know everybody knows you should be working on yourself physically it's same thing mentally you need to find the, that strength and resilience piece which comes from those six things and we call them psychological flexibility and it, you know, it's the smallest set that predicts the most things of anything known in western science hmm. arguably and i would say i'd win the argument i mean it's it's a, i mean i know it's self-praise because it's focused on my own work but oh, yeah. my own work is you know, 10,000 people around the world now working on this. So it's uh, it's not like me, me, me. It's more like I lit a match and other people built a, a bonfire. So uh, mm -hmm. it's been an amazing 40 year journey to figure out why that is. Why it's hard is that your logical, reasonable, sensible part of you, this problem solving mind will turn your life into a problem to be solved. Mm -hmm. And as soon as you do that, instead of a process to be lived, you're in trouble. As soon as you're bringing this kind of judgmental thing, what's wrong with me? You know, I need more of this. I need more confidence. I mean, it'll give you solutions that are the functional equivalent of the, you need to go from here to there, but you can't, you can't go there. I mean, it's one of these contradictions. So um, maybe we could explore that, but mm -hmm. it's so tricky that you can think you're solving your problems and you're actually making your problems worse. Yeah. Yeah. And you can do it for years on end and, you go, and and not know that you're doing it. And then you got this little voice within saying, no, this time for sure, you know, just, just do this. I know it hasn't worked yet, but really what you need to do is, and it's more of the toxic mm. crap that's gotten you into trouble in the first place. So well, how would you maybe differentiate between this style of like self-improvement and trying to, because you know, what I notice even in, in clinical work with people is everyone's really well, not everyone's trying the hardest. Sometimes people are avoiding and trying to kind of push things off. But when they really try to put rubber to the road, the strategies that they're trying to use to alleviate their pain, um, to try to have like a positive relationship with somebody, yeah. like, like they're really earnest and they're really fervent, but they're using strategies that are often creating the problems that they're trying to yeah. um, unwind. And so how do you differentiate between something that's psychologically flexible, something that's grounded in something uh, healthy versus something that's going to get you trapped and more tangled. You can distinguish personally by the fruits of it and pretty quickly. I mean, you, one cool thing about processes of change, when you study how you get from here to there and there's a there you want to get. Yeah, but to get there, there's steps. There's, you know, process is from a Latin word that means like a parade or procession. And the parade begins in some sort of predictable way. And those are the six things I was talking about. I mean, I think you can feel sometimes in a matter of seconds or minutes, you know, whether or not you made a positive or negative step. I mean, do mm. you feel like you're opening up, you're showing up, that you're empowered, you're more able to do it next time, uh, that do you feel more whole, do you feel more vital, do you feel like, uh, you, you know, this is... Uh, 
this is you? Does it feel more genuine? Does it feel more real? Does it feel, I mean, there's indicators that are there and we can see it in the science of it because we can take measures. Let's say if we intervene going after psychological flexibility processes to get something done, like a relationship, you're raising that, you know, we're going to try to build this relationship, do better in relationships more generally, but we're going to do it by working on being more emotionally open, more cognitively flexible, where your tension is flexible, you're consciously here, you know, mm. meeting the person behind those eyes is meeting the person behind your eyes, that you're being true to what you really care about and your actions resonate with being true to what you really care about. Mm. Well, there's a recent study looked at what is, predicts relationships. Those six things were powerful predictors of relationships in like a group of 13,000 people in a meta-analysis, you know, really gives you a different perspective on how you're gonna build relationships. Yeah, you got an end, but if you get too much focused on the end, have you ever dated somebody where you know the person really, really, really wants this to work even before they know who you are? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a train wreck. You feel like you're being treated as an object. Mm. You know, I mean, you you may have been on first dates with people where they're already talking about your long term uh, uh, status as a couple. And man, you, and any sensible person runs for the hills when the, when they see that, because they know what's going on here. Is this person wants a cartoon outcome? Mm. It can vary. You know, I want the white picket fence. I want the the big big house. I want love that'll never end. I want kisses from morning to night. I don't know what it is, but it's something. And whatever it is, you're going to be the vehicle. You're going to be the horse to ride. No, you're not. Because you're going to leave. You're going to withdraw because that's not a relationship. That's something else. That's using people for your own ends. And uh, if you want to relate, if that interconnection is what's of importance to you, that's a process issue. And that means vulnerability. That means being true to yourself. That means really listening. That means opening up. And these six things I've just mentioned will be real allies because you don't know what's going to come out. If I meet you in such a genuine way and I'm open to that experience, you may say something that's going to push my buttons. You might see something in me that I wish you hadn't noticed. Well, that's how relationships work when they're real and so you you want to do it real or you want to do cartoons you want to do cartoons you know i, I live in nevada you can drive just a few miles away and pay the money and get a cartoon mm -hmm. you know the, the bunny ranch is within driving distance mm -hmm. i can get the cartoon for love but it's not going to feel like it and it's not going to land like it's not going to alter your life in a way that a genuine relationship will so the mind tells you Get to the end, get to the end, get to the end. That's how you get there. It's one step. Mm. It doesn't necessarily have to be slow, but it has to be genuine. And yeah. focusing on the processes of change is the thing that liberates us. That's what's in this book over my shoulder. Yeah, yeah. I um yeah, I love that book. I I, I think I've read it a couple times now, trying to soak it all in because it's like something I just keep squeezing and there's more, <laughs> there's more there every time I can soak in. So if you're listening, grab his book, A Liberated Mind. Um, I'll plug that a couple times throughout because I yeah. really love that book. Um, Sorry for the plug, but it does lift up. <laughs> it's a, yeah, it's an important book. It's well, and something that I think I learned through that and even just studying your work over years is like what you're talking about this, like pay attention to what you're experiencing, pay attention to what's in front of you. And we have all these rules and we have this, whether they're cultural rules, religious rules, things that we are told as parents, things that we even just learned through trauma, things we learned about ourselves that we've come to believe is stably true, no matter the context and then we we live kind of within these blinders and and not they're not even always negative rules they can be very well intended and positive kind of morals and structures for life but they they teach us don't pay attention to the thing that you're experiencing but then maybe there's this other extreme where we're always just like hyper focused on our mood as, and our mood is like this compass for what is positive and negative in the world and that's a different form of chaos as well it's like sure how do you how do you differentiate between, okay, I'm paying attention to my experience. I'm not just like maybe moving forward blindly, but then I'm not maybe tossed and swayed by everything that comes in and out of my brain. Yeah, the, there's a dialectic there. You, there's a balance. 
Mm-hmm. And it's everywhere you look, you know, I mean, I'm really interested in evolution, variation and selection Well, selection, yeah. you know, creates structure, variation creates opportunity, um, acceptance and commitment. It, well, acceptance is being open up, open to what your history and circumstances are giving you. The commitment is to the path forward that creates what you're trying to create. And so, you know, like, let's take this issue of something like some of these things that, that are really are bedrock stable, like consciousness itself. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's a deep sense of awareness or, or observing or noticing that it. it has so many words around it. And some traditions, Buddhists, for example, say, don't even give it a name. Well, in the Christian tradition, mm-hmm. Judeo Christian tradition, you can't use God's name. I mean, mm-hmm. there's, there's this kind of prohibition of you. You almost mm-hmm. violate it to have a label for it because it's not it like. Mm-hmm. It's the, the simple bedrock of being in awareness, mm-hmm. um, the edges of which you can't contact, which may mean can't, can't talk to them consciously, which means that it's not it like. So it, it becomes ineffable, it's spiritual, etc. But it's a, a skill. And it's with you. So you showed up around three years old. When you were one, no. When you showed up around three as I here now, uh, there's a person behind these eyes of mine. And oh my God, there's a person behind mama's eyes. That showed up at a certain level of cognitive development. And then you couldn't even remember what happened a year or two before infantile amnesia shows up. I've, if you have kids, you, you will see it happen. Those little songs they sang when they were one or two, they can't sing when they're three or four, they've forgotten them, unless you refresh them after that shift happened. So there's one that's bedrock. You show up in consciousness around age three, and from there on, everything you experience is put on like this little dimensionless, tiny, thin strand of consciousness, yeah. and you can go back and memory, remember what it was like to be in first grade. You can remember what that trauma was like or that rejection was like. So that's one thing that doesn't change. Mm-hmm. Values are pretty stable. You know, what do you really want to be about? What, what, what is the lighthouse in the distance for you? Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't mean just the goals. I mean the, the qualities you respect, admire, and want to reflect. Mm-hmm. You know, the things that are in your heroes. In, in your guides, in the people who lift you up, or the, the same thing, the things that are inside, why it hurts so much. You know, why does it hurt to be betrayed in relationships? Mm-hmm. Well, maybe because you value loyalty. If you didn't value loyalty, it wouldn't hurt. So on the other side of your hurt, you've got, those are stable. Things like emotions, thoughts, attention, those things are going, because it depends on the context, depends on the circumstance. I mean, like, take emotion. Is there emotion you can name that you don't pay money to produce? Mm. The reason I'm saying pay money to produce is there's lots of them you'd call negative. You'd call bad, right? Sad, bad, mad, bad. Yeah, but wait a minute, dude. You actually pay money to produce it. You ride roller coasters. You watch horror movies. You read tearjerkers. I mean, come on. Don't be telling me that those emotions are things you can't have because they're bad why are you paying money for it wow so so but your mind's saying no no I, when i have sugar soup from morning to night my life will be fine i just need to get rid of this anxiety this sadness this guilt this shame this i just that's all i need if i could just do that i, I, I i'm not confident i need to get rid of it i'm not good luck with that because at the very moment that you do that you're basically saying whole portions of me are my own enemy Hmm. that does not going to feel confident that's not going to empower you to walk into situations that might be sad you know what what happens if your friend dies what happens if you found out that uh, you know some somebody got covid and they're i mean sad is going to show up Hmm. you don't want sad to show up you have to be dead or numb that's Mm -hmm. it those are the only two options Mm -hmm. Uh, none of neither one of those are going to live well so there's going on a little bit too much no that's good i mean because i hear you saying there's 
there's there's things that are stable and that that would be like the values and maybe even the experiences that we've had that like you can't go back in the past and change these formative yeah. experiences your development the things that have been crucial to who you are and then the values that like when you look out into the future like and you think the world should be better like this like yeah. that's that's deeply ingrained and we've even seen that within like personality that like there's sure. even like links between certain kinds of value structures and how your personality is organized and and so those those things are really stable and and i think this is was a big insight for me too is noticing that like my emotions sway you know back and forth and can respond to how those values are interacting within different contexts yeah but, um but even like when i feel like okay i'm running into a brick wall because i have like this very rigid idea of how this value is supposed to be expressed and yeah. how this value is supposed to be lived out and then the emotional response I'm supposed to be feeling in line with that. So I'll give like an example. It could be um, like, I, I talk to a lot of people that are like deconstructing like Christian faith, for example, or um, yeah. Mormon faith. I have like a lot of Mormon clients. I have a lot of sure. Christian clients. Uh, I have a few um, clients that are like just kind of in, in spirituality and trying to make sense of that yeah. within uh, like science and, and just what they're reading in college or, you know, all sorts of things. So that's like yeah. a normal kind of like life process is like, okay, how much of this of what I grew up with is mine? How much of it is my parents? And there's incredible shame and incredible guilt because the idea would be, I'm supposed to go to church. I'm supposed to read the Bible. I'm supposed to pray. And then I'm supposed to feel this. And then I, and then I shouldn't feel um, lust and guilt over things that I can't, you know, seem to like get a handle yeah. on myself. And there's whole, this whole world, this whole ecosystem full of connections and relations of how those values are supposed to act. And then, you know, like my, my like clinical work with them is, is hardly trying to correct the theology. It's trying to connect how the things are relating to each other. And like, what does it look like to express love? What does it look like to express kindness? And like, like a big aha moment that I'll, that, that I usually share, especially with young men who maybe come in for like struggling with pornography and then feeling really guilty about that. And they have a lot of religious reasons for feeling really frustrated at themselves for enjoying pornography is like, is it a sin to enjoy eroticism? And that's like, uh, yeah. And I'm like, is, is, is sexual feelings, are those always temptation yeah. or can sexual feelings be something that, you know, you were designed to feel? something that yeah. you were designed to experience and enjoy. Yeah. And, and maybe you're experiencing them in a context that violates your values, but this feeling and reaction, this draw that you have to this isn't something about your nature that's flawed and evil. It's something that yeah. is beautiful and, and, and good in the right context that's aligned with your values. So how do you, how do you, you know, as, as I'm talking about all that, what's coming to your mind? Yeah. You know, we're one of the, the, the act folks have actually done work on, on pornography. We were one of the, mm -hmm ones who've, uh, I wrote a blog some time ago called the, the problem that shall not be named or something. I mean, it's one of those ones where the, the kind of scientists don't want to get close to it because they're afraid that they're going to be, you know, viewed as prudes or whatever, but you know, yeah, people, yeah, get, yeah. people get wrapped around the axle of, of pornography and they're spending hours on end, uh, you know, watching porn on stuff the ways that don't lift them up. It isn't really about sexual feelings. It's about something else. Mm. How to untangle that. One of the things we found in our randomized trials with ACT for pornography is that, uh, you know, where, where you're talking about the person himself saying, I'm, I'm spending way too much time. I'm way too much into this. You know, almost anybody would agree that like spending a lot of time at work on, on your your employer's computer, look at a porn is not a good idea. Yeah, yeah. Your, your, your risk of losing your job, your risk of, yeah, come on, dude, what are you doing? <laughs> you know, you just, you, I mean, don't be telling me, oh, you know, it's a, I don't want to just hear some sort of sexual freedom rap. Yeah. I mean, yeah. People are wrapped around an axle that's clearly not helpful for right. them. And so what has happened when we bring these flexibility concepts in is, yeah, the viewing goes way down, way, way down. But also the, the, the kind of scrupulosity goes down. Mm. The self-criticism and blame goes down. The shame goes down. Some of this stuff is almost like, you know, don't eat that donut in the refrigerator. Don't eat it. Don't eat it. But next thing you know, 
freaking thinking about nothing else but donuts, and then you go eat the donut. You know, I mean, some of it is more like almost an obsessive pattern. Mm -hmm. So how do we bring these things in balance? And you asked it in a good way. You know, what is the role, for example, of sexual feelings and so forth? Now, our, actually, our wisdom traditions, our spiritual traditions almost always got it right. Mm. I mean, take temptation, for example. Mm -hmm. Almost, um, you know, anyone who's getting scrupulous religiously is going to be saying, oh, i got to put all my temptations behind me, get behind me, Satan, etc. Yeah, but uh, I, I had a, 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 a former student of mine who was uh, an LDS person who was working at, at uh, BYU and uh, had a group for uh, gay men as to what to deal, how to deal with their own sexuality. LDS is pretty strong on here's the religious thing you're supposed to do. And uh, the bishop, one of the bishops got kind of upset with him because he heard that he was having this group and wanted him to just, you know, come in guns a blazing, no, 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 you know, let's shame him out of it kind of thing. Yeah. And my friend uh, said, well, what about the temptation of Christ? Do you think he was tempted? And if, if he was, is temptation a sin? So did Christ commit a sin? Or, or isn't that story in there because he wasn't tempted at all? Mm. Well, then why, the sto why is the story in there? Mm -hmm. You know, and they argued the bishop and the, okay, you can run your group, you know? Because, <laughs> yeah, yeah. you know, it's in our stories, it's in our wisdom traditions you know, that even in the, in the Christian tradition, you know, God made us a man exposing himself to what shows up with that. And that includes temptation. Yeah. It includes it. But the sin doesn't come from that. In our mm -hmm. religious traditions, it comes from an act of the will hmm. that takes you off a path that you want to be on. So how do you integrate these thoughts, feelings, memories, and bodily sensations in a values-based life? How do you do that? And that's actually the core of the ACT journey. It's, mm. It is address that question, take it seriously. And, um, and then you end up with these weird things like uh, scrupulosity goes down, but so does viewing. Yeah, well, and I want to ask you more about this because, you know, I think a complex part of a lot of maybe religious people's experiences, there are thought sins. You know, there, there, are, there are mental games that you can play that, that count as, as a moral <laughs> infraction. And, and uh, like I was talking to a, a psychoanalyst um, in Seattle and, and he was really challenging me on this. And he's like, no, there's no thought sense because you have no control of your thoughts. And I'm like, no, like there's, I can, I can indulge a thought and that seems like an act of the will. And then I can, or I can refrain from indulging in a thought, but the, the complexity in all of this, I think really is, is like fresh ground for just fixations and complexes and yeah, all yeah, yeah. I mean, especially because the, the, you know, the part of, problem solving part of your mind, which in this book I call the dictator within, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. will grab on to uh, this issue of thought sins and will, will torment you. Yeah. But of course, it's the very core of the process. It's inside the thing that's being pointed to. They were talking about this analytic judgmental uh, evaluative mode of mind. So, you know, I think, uh, it, you know, I, I went to... Um, uh, Catholic school. I was raised uh, raised mm. as a Catholic, but I, my mother, who I didn't discover until I was a teenager, was Jewish by the maternal line. That's a oh really? Story. Yeah. So I would have Catholic guilt from a Jewish mother. That's really not fair. But uh, uh, you know, the, I think the in, in inside uh, that tradition, uh, it's the thought deliberately bought, willed, affirmed, chosen fused with mm. that is harmful to us that's what's in act theory too yeah but not in the language of sin but in the language of inflexibility mm. and that act of buying fusing with entering into believing adopting i mean those kind of words have a cost because it changes the world you live in it's now structured in terms of this little piece of cognition but a thought or a memory or an emotion that, that is experienced without that action is different. I mean, there is not a religious tradition that I know of that is, you know, calls wet dreams a sin, for example. Well, if thoughts were sins, why isn't that a sin? Well, it's just not going to be because it's, 
no act of the will. Conversely, if you say, okay, I'm going to kill that person. I'm going to do it. I'm actually going to do it. And you, you get the stuff and you've made the choice and you're going and you've got the things. And then, you know, a cop drives by. And, oh, my God. No, I'd say, dude, you put into your behavior by your affirmation of a pattern that you're playing out. You put in there something that's going to have a cost for you. I mean, you chose that uh, it's okay for you to remove somebody else's life. Mm. And it was interrupted. Yeah. The bomb didn't go off. It doesn't but that still you. had an effect on you. It has an effect on you. And, you know, the consequences aren't because, you know, uh, uh, an old guy with a beard, you know, came down and said, you've gone too far. You know, no, I mean, I, the consequences of these things are immediate. You can feel it when you yeah. disconnect yourself from your own values. Mm -hmm. there's, a con there's a cost to that. Yeah. If what I want to be about, for example, is being loving. And then this morning something shows up. My wife pushes my buttons. And next thing you know, I'm ripping her up one side down the other. And I'm, you know, okay. Mm -hmm. That's... That's not in accord with what the kind of person you want to be. Mm. And so that's worth attention that you violated a, a values commitment that you have. Yeah. You know, we go through these rituals of marriage commitments or, you know, commitments of, uh, you know, to our, our, our teammates or whatever. What do they mean if mm. at any point you can just say, nah, do they mean nothing? Mm. You know, so how do you make a commitment how that's why it's acceptance and commitment yeah Perfect. yeah yeah what is the commitment we're talking about it's a commitment to larger and larger patterns of values-based action it's not a commitment to perfection it's not a commitment to purity it's not saying you know i'm god on earth and i will never make it no that's narcissism dude that's not commitment commitment is a hundred percent and when you slip, you, you acknowledge, you see it, you realize it, and then you show up again 100%. It's this dialectic of, uh, I'm going for it. Yeah. Like, metaphorically, it'd be like, I was, I was dealing with a person who liked to climb mountains, and she said, you know, I'm realizing in this that what you're asking me to do is like what I have to do on the mountain if I'm going to learn a new move. If I'm only going to do it halfway, I'm I'm coming off the rock. He's roped in. I, I, yeah, I'm out with a free climber. I don't. My son was into that. Don't, don't tell me about free climbers. Don't do it. But, <laughs> yeah. But uh, you, but there's that quality in in the area where you can't do some things halfway. You can't jump off across a big ravine or something that you can make by walking across it you can't do a half jump sometimes mm -hmm. you've got to do a full jump mm -hmm. and there's examples like that but acceptance is like that it's a it's a full jump yeah the way i like acceptance to explain part it. of commit and commitment is a commitment to opening up to your emotions what are they well i won't know until i open up to them yeah so the commitment comes before the experience even yeah that's so so good. it's this weird kind of dialectic of Yes, you're going to slip. Yes, you're going to fall. And you're committed. You're leaping. You're jumping. You're, you're not kind of, oh, I can only when I'm reassured, you know, promise me it'll work out. You know, mm -hmm. not going to work out because that very process uh, sometimes can work. You know, sometimes you can put your toe in the water, but sometimes you have to jump in the water. And if you're in a situation like that, self acceptance is like that, letting go of, thoughts that you're wrapped around is mm. like that. showing up in consciousness is like that yeah uh, knowing what you really care about and affirmatively saying this is what i'm up to this is what i'm about this is what i want to see in my behavior is like that so yeah well the way i like to explain that is is like i went i went bungee jumping a couple of years ago and was absolutely terrified and there's no halfway to bungee jump no it's like, you're, yeah, exactly you're either leaving or you're not and what was interesting is like you know, I, I don't know the physics of how a bungee cord works or if it can support my weight or not. Like, and I don't like, and I didn't right. research that before jumping. And uh, I looked at reviews. It seems like people survived. Um, so <laughs> I, I figured, and then I watched several people do it. 
and and they seemed to make it out okay without like broken vertebrae and you know like head injuries and so i i leaped and and that's the ironic thing maybe about you know like some of the most core commitments and some of the most deeply held beliefs we have there's just there's these crossroads in life where we either act as if we believe one thing or act as if we don't and and there's ways that we deal with ourselves even mentally that we either act towards ourselves compassionately and with uh, flexibility and kind of kindness or we deal with ourselves harshly there's all these crossroads and regardless of all the mechanisms that we think we understand or don't regardless of all the theological points we feel like we want to live into or hit like we believe something and then we and and belief isn't an, an aspect of just being convinced enough it's it's the leap and that's awesome and i think the benjamin was a great example mm -hmm. you know there is you know there is analytic judgmental thought in there am i wearing the harness properly you know mm -hmm. has this okay. is the cord designed yeah. and for my weight has it been tested recently how old is it is this a responsible operator of the bungee jump yeah, yeah. that's right there's things like that that are analytic judgmental kind of things and then there's the stepping up backward off the ledge Mm -hmm. I did that in, in New Zealand, same thing on a bungee jump and that kind of thing. And, uh, you know, I'd never, I never, heights terrify me. I mean, just <laughs> running out on the glass, you yeah, know, me too. Yeah. on one of those big towers, you know, oh, you know. <laughs> and, and there's something profound in there as a model of a lot of things in life. And I think that that is a metaphor would really apply to the things that we've been talking about in this whole conversation yeah. the psychological flexibility i think has that quality of taking on your history you're still rational you're looking and then making that leap into wholeness into vitality into living a whole life that is about something of living life in a way that's i don't know i wanted to say big but that's not quite it not playing life small but it's not big because it's not like oh i'm great and grand no, i mean being all of what you can be, what life has given you as an opportunity. And who knows where that go will go. This disconfirmed expectation your thing you're talking about, you know, where you have a plan out. Oh, here's, a, here's the way it's going to go. I'm going to do this and this, and then that's going to lead to that. And that, it's almost always wrong. Yeah. You know, there's data on that, you know, where you ask people to predict how is it going to land when you do this or this or this? Bungee jumping is not a bad example. Have you ever tried to get a friend to do it who doesn't want to do it? <laughs> they, they will refuse. <laughs> I'll give you a thousand different reasons. And you're yeah. saying, no, just trust it, really. Well, uh, you know, afterwards, you're going to thank me. Yeah. And it's true. It's 100% <laughs> certain. I was on one of these at one of these zip lines in New Zealand. New yeah. Zealanders are insane about having all these kind of athletic challenges and stuff. It's just huge zip line. And, you know, I've never written one before. And I'm having all these thoughts about how it's going to be, how I'm scared I'm going to be. I don't like heights anyway. You know, they do the little like that. And I'm now, I don't know, several hundred feet in the air on a long, long mountain ride down. And here's what shows up in my, out of my mouth within about 300 milliseconds. Whee! <laughs> yeah, yeah. I had no idea what the experience, how the experience was going to land. My mind was just blah, 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 blah. How many things are like that? Yeah. Where you're just a millisecond, just, a, just a, a little bit away from a we of a love commitment or a we of singing without restraint or a we of dancing or a we of, you know, choosing a path that's going to challenge you to maybe starting a podcast, maybe writing a story, maybe, you know, posting a blog. I, I don't know what your we is. The true thing is you don't either mm. <laughs> until you do it. But here's what you do know. What do you care about? Mm -hmm. What do you want to be about? And if you can sort of dig into the, the yearning that you have, to be yourself, mm. uh, you know, there's within, there's an ally uh, that will move you and that will, you know, have you put on that harness and go off backwards. I mean, not saying, you know, I mean, as a bungee jumper, you know, that's not the definition, but it's a mob of something that is a definition. That's right. And when that moment comes and you're, you know, are you going to 
propose to this person or earlier in this, are you going to say, <laughs> I love you and mean it? Mm -hmm. But earlier, are you going to look that person in the eye and allow them to see you seeing them, see yeah. in you your story, some of which is not stuff that you tell easily to anyone mm -hmm. or maybe never to anyone you know, you can see what I'm talking about. There's bungee jumps that are there from the first moment to the last in terms of anything you can name. Well, and they're yeah. self-evident too when you encounter them. And, and I think our, our minds have, have really clever ways of trying to nullify them and, and, and get them out of, I don't know, the realm of possibility. Like, yeah. like, uh, like I talk to a lot of people that don't know what they find meaningful in life, don't feel like they have like a real purpose, don't know what they're excited about, don't know what kind of job you want to like work. And, you know, and they feel very dissatisfied and frustrated, but they also don't, they, they don't feel any vitality. And so conversations like this almost like fall flat because it's like, I don't know what, I, I don't know where the bungee cord is. I don't know where the bridge is. Like, exactly. What is it? And the thing I always press to, and this, and this in part, I learned from you. And, and I think I, and I've listened to a lot of Jordan Peterson too. He talks about this where yeah. he's like, look at the suffering. And, and because you, you can't talk that away. Like you can talk away how marriage is ridiculous and, you know, like uh, vitality and living life and doing all those things. Uh, if you can talk all that away, but you can't talk away your suffering. Yeah. You can't talk yourself into not being affected by how miserable you are. And then he says, and look there, because if you look there and you turn it over, that's the locus of meaning. Exactly right. And, and you said it earlier, you're like, the reason the rejection, the relationship hurts is because the relationship mattered. Even the reason why you feel like your life is purposeless hurts and, and is frustrating is because purpose and vitality matter. Exactly. Exactly. There's, there, there's a, like a paradox in here because people are saying it's empty. It's meaningless. Dude, wait a minute. Look at the distress you're experiencing right now inside empty and meaningless mm -hmm. that's not empty that's not meaningless mm -hmm. you know so go there and you know the acceptance and commitment part the acceptance part is the is earlier than the commitment part you mm -hmm. yeah that's good that, some people can access their values early on uh, you know but often people can't and where they need to start is where they are mm -hmm. and it doesn't help to start from where you're not when you're confident, you'll, that's starting from where you're not. When I'm not so anxious, I'll, that's starting from where you're not. What's going on now? I'm anxious. I don't have any confidence. I said, okay, great. Let's go there. And by the way, that's the most confident thing anyone can do because the word means with faith. That's what yeah. the part of confidence means with faith. Let's have faith in yourself. Let's have faith, even the leap that your pain matters. Mm. Your suffering matters. Yeah. Your entanglement matters. Mm -hmm. Your life matters. You matter. And if if you can just take that far, then you can learn the skills that will walk you into the hell of your own history, that will walk you into how it happened that you learned not to feel. Yeah. I mean, you probably had a long history of that. I mean, take somebody like, uh, you know, I'll, I'll even go something like dissociation early trauma early trauma it requires this you know if a terrorist showed up in this moment with a machine gun in my office at age 72 you know i am not going to dissociate i don't know how to dissociate mm. but if you do that to a three-year-old or a four-year-old or a five-year-old you terrorize them or you abuse them you put them in an impossible situation you sexually abuse them you do something like that Sometimes it shows up that if I split, not that you're doing it logically, you're doing it psychologically. If I'm not really me, there's like this dissociative process of clicking in where sense of self, that integrity. I went back to that dimensional strand that showed up around age three, you know, where I here now I'm aware. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but if you have trauma early enough, you realize if it's not I here now, yeah. you kind of self-soothe, it feels better. Yeah. Yeah, it's that cocoon, that safety around reality that keeps you okay in the moment, but that it, it, if you don't learn how to then exit that and then engage with reality, you'll be maybe, you know, like my age frustrated at life because you can't feel anything. Exactly. And that's, that's a, I make a lot of videos kind of like around this idea of dissociation and not being able to feel your life and how frustrating that is. And 
because it, it's such a universal feeling for anyone who's undergone severe trauma or neglect or anyone who it's just like, why do I just feel like I'm observing my life as this third party yeah. and I'm not, and, and I have no access to this vitality. And then part, I mean, this is kind of simplistic summary of it, but the, but the idea of going confront the hardest part and, and maybe you have, don't even have memory of that. Maybe those memories are literally being blocked in your head of the painful things yeah. you went there, but your body remembers. And so, oh, absolutely. so go into those places and, and if you, and it's giving you those indications that you don't even read. Yeah, 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 the avoidance so that you can't know that keeps you in ignorance so that you can't say, you know, it, it's this cascade. And, you know, sometimes it started so early. I mean, it's just a kid dealing with stuff. I mean, you can't look at that and say, oh, that, 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 see, that shows you something wrong with me. No, dude, that little one was doing the very best that he or she could. Yeah, and yeah, you know, they... You, you know, you decided I'll just push down the pain. Yeah. And yeah, that had a cost. And it's led, led to alexithymia. I can't even say what I feel, et cetera. You know, I, I've done a lot of work on this, as you know, you know experiential avoidance is at the core of psychological inflexibility. Mm -hmm. And sometimes people think, oh man, that you must be really good at this. No, I'm really bad at it. <laughs> Ask my wife. That's why it's so important to me. And I've been on a life journey because... You know, I grew up in a home with domestic violence, and I've told that story in my uh, TEDx talk. You can Google it and find it. That walks through from my own history of panic disorder years later and finding this deep down old stinky memories of domestic violence in, in my home. And, and I kind of knew it, but I didn't know how deep it had penetrated me and how much of a commitment I had made to not feeling mm. unwisely, but at, at ages, you know, six, seven, eight years old, yeah. when that was the best I could do. Yeah. Uh, so you're going to have to renegotiate some of that with yourself. And I, you know, I think of the, the path to meaning and purpose has to start with a path to feeling, mm. to being, to be able to be here now. And so literally, that's why I mean things like noticing what your body is doing and the different, you know, body scans. You take something like Tom Cabot's in kind of classic mindfulness stuff. It's important. That's precisely it. Because when you really press someone to sit in the moment, and then I, I like I, I give people an assignment, and it seems like silly at first, but then they realize it's maybe the hardest thing they've ever tried. I'm like, sit quietly for 10 minutes. Yeah. Like just, just quiet silence on the floor, just sit there. And then the chaos that arises from within <laughs> that, that starts to flood the mind of all the things you need to fix, all the things that aren't going okay, all the things that you need. It's like, and then just some basic detachment practices of like noticing those thoughts, not sitting in judgment of them, just noticing that they're there. It's like the past will come up. The yeah. past, the past will come up in its time. And, and the journey towards the past isn't in trying to recollect all these painful memories. It's almost sitting in the present moment. And then as different versions of you is one way to think about it emerge. It's like meeting them and greeting them and, and forming a relationship with them and trying to understand what they're saying, trying to understand what they're, what they're beckoning you for and, yeah. and bringing in power. I love ways. that way of talking about it. I mean, it's almost like you're, you're kind of inviting all these different eras and different selves and different ways to, to come in. You all, you all have a place. Come on, come out, yeah. come out. And the ugly ones and the pretty ones and the sad ones and the joyful ones have a place to come in, you know, the, uh, so just yeah this just it's not the pa dead past that we're interested in we're interested in the past is in the present yeah how right. would you how would you find that by being present by simply putting your mind on un unemployment you don't need analytic judgmental things to just be yourself right mm -hmm. so like just sitting and noticing and you know those techniques that are there whether it's following a breath or focusing on a particular point you know these things that have been around for thousands of years of yeah. messing around with attentional processes and then noticing that your attention is a chaotic mess i mean you can't sit in silence for more than two minutes before your, your attention's running away yeah i mean two minutes is long it's probably less than that yeah and that then bringing it back it runs away bringing it back why? To catch that you can notice it running away and you can bring it back, which means that you do have the capacity as to what to attend to.
Mm -hmm. You do have the capacity to say, I'm going to listen to that crying child within. I'm going to actually notice that scary feeling. Mm -hmm. I'm going to notice that bodily reaction. And being open to that, you're going to have to practice it. You're not going to just say it once and have it done. Mm -hmm. And in that experience, well, you begin to sort of say, it's okay to be me. And in that experience, the vitality that comes from how to, what is the best me? I mean, what is the me that I want to be? I mean, who am I anyway? Mm -hmm. From this more spiritual point of view, you can actually say, I'm on a journey where love matters. I'm on a journey where kindness matters, where contribution matters, where being there for others matters. Why? I don't know. Just because that's what I'm here to do. It doesn't, it's not a formula. If you gave it to somebody and said, here are the values you should embrace, that would not be it. You know, this has to be between you and the person in the mirror. Mm -hmm. Knowing full well, by the way, if you commit to being loving, you're going to slip. You're going to do things that are not loving. But that won't even be noticed until you open up to being able to notice anything, to be able to feel, to remember, to sense, to be here, and to care enough to actually have a direction that matters. Then you can notice I'm wandering. Mm. That's not the direction I wanted to go in and then bring it back. Mm. That process of commitment is the process to catch and bring back. So it's it's a small yeah. set of skills, but man, is it subtle because the mind just wants you to either be spring forth from the head of Zeus, not have to go through the process or start from where you're not, wait till it's all safe and nobody knows how to do that. So we just sit and wait for our life to be over. Yeah, and and, and that's not an exaggeration. Certainly there are people no. who are just like, okay, I'm shutting off all awareness because every time I pay attention, it hurts. Yeah. And so I'm just waiting for this to be over. Yeah. And, you know, like I think about when you're sitting in these moments of silence and all these things are coming up, it's, it's extremely um, frustrating and, and disorienting and uh, fear provoking. And, and a lot of people are like, well, what's the use in doing all that and trying to drudge up all this terrible emotion. And uh, it's, it's, it, I don't know. There's a lot of different ways of explaining that one piece that I just throw in there sometimes is like, all of that is there and affecting your behavior, whether you're aware of it or not. It's like, yeah it's in there. It's been affecting your marriage for 20 years. Like exactly. looking at it isn't the thing that's ruining your life. It's, it's almost yeah. just ignoring it and keeping it back there. I don't know. Well, the way we usually say it is you say, Oh, I don't want that. Yeah. Want actually the etymology of the word means missing. And I get that you're not missing pain. You don't jump out of the morning and say, Hey, I want pain today. Oh, yeah. No, I get that. I get that. And we're not talking about feeling painful things that weren't already here that you're feeling. Yeah. If you're talking about showing up to your feelings, you're feeling the feelings you feel already anyway. The yeah. only way that you would know to avoid them mm -hmm. is if you felt them first and then avoided them. Now, it is true if you build a big enough pattern of avoidance, mm -hmm. then you become so stupid that you don't know what you were avoiding. That is true. Yeah. Yeah. But then you get to feel what it feels like to be ignorant, to not know yourself to still be avoiding, mind you, mm -hmm. these little micro moments that show up with these flitterings of memory that are flittering so fast you can't even say what the memory is, or these little intuitive sense or the gut sense in your body or something, you're still avoiding. If you didn't, it would show up because it's in your history, mm -hmm. right? So you're not avoiding so thoroughly that it's not part of your history. Yeah. yeah. You're avoiding so thoroughly that you get to be stupid. Yeah. 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 Okay, what do you get to feel then? You get to still have that feeling playing its role, not in the full way that it could play if you could feel it and flip it and see what it tells you about what you deeply care about. For example, mm -hmm. you get all of the toxic part and out of the healthy part. Yeah. And absolutely. you get to feel what it feels like to be numb and to have no purpose and to not really be you. Yeah, which creates tons of negative emotion. All yeah. about. Yeah. So now you get the dirty emotion. I, it's a little judgmental, but there's an act thing about clean and dirty, you know, and my wife really loves this little thing where she draws a little circle on the, on the, on a poster board. And she says, okay, so this is the pain. 
whatever it is, what are you going to do to adjust to it? And there's 101 different things, most of which are avoidant. You know, she uses the example of uh, she used to get, you know, avoid paying parking fees. It just made her so mad because there's not enough parking spots on campus and she has a sticker, but she can't find a parking space. So she's going to park here, but it's the one that you have to come and pay. So she doesn't pay. So she comes back and she has a $20 ticket. And so then she takes the ticket and she throws it in a pile in her uh, in, in her glove department. She, glove box. She's going to get it and she's going to pay, but then it's the first even thing about it. So then she doesn't pay. And then she gets a little notice that the $20 a, a ticket is now a forty dollar ticket, and that so so this paint circle is getting bigger and getting bigger and bigger. It's eventually they bootlock her freaking car. Yeah. So, so, but it's like that. Whether it's okay, I'll drink so that I don't have to remember. Okay, great. I'll I'll break up this relationship so I don't feel vulnerable. Great. I'll not take advantage of that opportunity at work because it might push my buttons and maybe I won't be good enough. So I'll just live life small. Great. Is that little circle of pain getting bigger or smaller? It's getting bigger. And so can we walk this thing back? You know, have you suffered enough? When people really get into this space and say, I'll do what you're asking as long as you can guarantee me that I'm not going to hurt. I say, dude, maybe you haven't suffered enough. Yeah. Wow. Come back when you're ready. What a powerful thing to say. And I don't, not doing it critically. I'm not, no, yeah. really, I'm not trying to shame. It's I'm just the truth. Me. It's just holding up a mirror. It's just holding up a mirror. Yeah. Well, the word, the word suffer means it comes from a fur part. That fur part is from the word fair, fairy. It means to carry like, you know, a fairy boat. And the soft part is up and under. It's a, that, that wow. prefix, right? So here, the metaphor of suffering is, you're up and under and carrying, carrying this heavy thing. Mm. How about putting it down? Yeah. Are you ready to put it down? Mm. But put it down means now it's going to be right there in front of you. You're going to look at it. You're going to see it. But that's the path, the pain. Yes, mm. but good, clean pain from which you can learn. Not the heavy, dull, stinky, old, ancient, forever, will never end pain yeah. of pain not seen not learned from not used where you didn't allow the pain of your own history to guide you you stubbornly hung on to this idea of no 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 okay here's what you get you get to carry your pain like a heavy burden with no benefit yeah and you'll add more you're like putting more weights well and people do that i think because one of the false solutions i think a lot of people run to is I just got to put on more rules around yeah. how to self-improve and then I'll feel positive emotions if I can just perform to my standards. Yeah. And, and self-criticism gets really brutal. Like, like maybe going back to our example in pornography, something I, I see constantly, especially within religious people is like, okay, I, I can't lust over girls. So I just avoid women. And because I don't want to be lustful of them. And I'm like, why are you objectifying them? And like, no, 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 no. The, the point's not to. And I'm like, no, they're still an object. You're yeah. just avoiding it now instead of indulging in it. Yeah. And and that is like this this aha moment because I'm like, what would it look like to to reference and, or, or sorry, relate to them as a person, as as like exactly. as a neighbor, as a as a sister, daughter, friend, clerk. Like like you're still seeing them as something sexual, right. um, but just something to be avoided rather to be indulged in. And and it's because these large kind of concrete rules that we kind of put on top of our insufficiencies to try to to try to redeem us end up being a larger weight they add on top of that boat of suffering and then we're carrying even a larger load and then we get cynical about the rules that that we're supposed to deliver us and uh or cynical about ourselves as just this completely insufficient creature that can't even dot 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 and it becomes even a greater trap yeah well the dominance of verbal rules and the insensitivity that creates the same the two most you know, criti- the easiest way is to inflexibility, psychological inflexibility right. of, you know, pushing away emotions, getting wrapped around your thoughts, not being able to allocate your attention flexibly from this conceptual self you have, not this witnessing part of spiritual part of you, but the categorical evaluative part of you. And to just pursue success or whatever in this kind of chaotic uh, way that whatever shows up either impulsively or rigidly slogging on 
those six things, you know, the, the thing that, you know, most predicts that it is not being able to sort of, you know, be here in the present with, and the two cert, most certain pathways to it, just follow the rules mm. and avoid. Mm-hmm. If you, the, they're the most powerful insensitivity instruments known. Just follow the rules and avoid. Awesome. Now, if we're going to do something different, we're going to have to notice that you have rules and come here in the present. Notice that you have things that can, could avoid, come here in the present. That's the acceptance and mindfulness part. And then from this more spiritual part of you, what I want to be about and how do I build habits around it? That's the commitment part. Mm-hmm. And learning that gives you a place to put the rules. They can be helpful even, but not in this rigid way. And to put the avoidance, the avo- when you notice you're avoiding, it gives you a little flashlight towards some work that you have to do yeah. to go into what it is that you're avoiding and mm-hmm. find out what's in there. Is there anything in there that is useful to me? And almost always the answer is yes. It's, it's not what your mind fears. You're not going to be overwhelmed. You're not going to disappear into it. You're not, you know, if you notice your insecurities, you're not going to become a blithering you know, ball of protoplasm. You, that is a really confident thing to do. Yeah. I'm big enough to actually even notice my insecurities. What a secure thing to do. Mm-hmm. It's an awesome thing to do. Mm-hmm. And you may find that there's people around you who feel insecure too. And you may have conversations with them mm-hmm. that are empowered by the fact that you've been willing to explore that. Mm-hmm. And if you have children later on and they come to you with your insecurities, you'll know something to say. I, I say things mm-hmm. to people, you want to avoid? Okay, I'll give you, here's a magic pill. You can avoid all these things. Mm-hmm. Sadness, you want to avoid it? We'll avoid it. Fear, you want to avoid it? We'll avoid it 100%. But here's the only part of this devil's bargain if you ever have kids and they come to you or a pe- person that you love who comes to you and says what do i do with and then they name that thing that you've handled 100 percent, you will have no sense of what they're talking about mm-hmm. if it's fear you'll have no idea what fear even is wow you want to take this bargain i've never met anyone who wants to take the bargain They want to get rid of fear and still have the wisdom that comes, the humanity that comes from being able to feel fear. It doesn't come that way. If you're going to suppress and get rid of, you're going to pay the cost of not knowing. Mm -hmm. And so I know it's a a challenge. Life is a challenge. It is. It's a lifelong challenge. It never finishes. Are you up for it? You want to go for it. If you don't want to go for it, maybe you've not suffered enough. You know, and, and frankly, so I, I, would, I would rather refer you to somebody else if you're coming to me. I, <laughs> I would rather have folks who have suffered so much that we've actually seen this in the ACT work that people who have multiple problems and they've suffered a lot, you know, ACT as an evidence-based therapy. Yeah. If you compare it to traditional CBT or things like that, the places where it's better, it's multi-problem, chronic, difficult, et cetera, because we really go after that Gordian knot of, how do you get yourself into these cul-de-sacs and how can you walk yourself out? And it's not just one, it's usually many. And mm, so if you're good. ready for that, a, you know, a book like that can help. If you just absolutely. want to play little baby bouncies, there's probably other things you can do. Well, and what I love to use an analogy in the book that, that I've used incessantly since, cause it's just so powerful. And that was just the idea of pivoting. And then you just said something really simple of just like, yeah, when you were a toddler, it took you like 10,000 falls to figure out how to pivot. And, yeah. and it never occurred to me. I never thought about that. I was just like, oh, it's just the simple action of taking a step, changing direction, shifting your weight. You fell over like, t- is it 10,000 or am I getting a number? Some ridiculous number when they do yeah. that. It's just average toddler falls something like a hundred times a day while walking 10 <laughs> football fields. You know, it's just an insane amount of falling before you can learn how to do these things. And so and all these by concepts- trial and error, you know, you weren't so mighty yeah. as you are now. Well, and, and all these concepts can feel very ethereal. It can feel very just like, like, oh, I'll never be able to get there. It just feels like this attainment thing. And it's not that. It's not an attainment thing any more than it is like a toddler learning how to walk and then like a successful pivot. And then just let's just do that again. Like, and then tomorrow I'll do that again because I get to go where I want to go. The more I can do that. Yeah, yeah exactly. And, uh, 
I mean, if we can get there, you know, then life becomes your teacher. You don't, you know, you don't need a yeah. therapist uh, 24 seven. You, you don't need to be reading self-help books from morning till night, you know, do what you need to do to get your life going and life itself will begin to teach you, you know, and, right. and you're going to keep learning because you're going to have to pivot and move around obstacles. I didn't know how to negotiate that before, you know, okay, let me try. And then when you fall, try again, when you fall, try, try again, but with guidance and the guidance that the psychological flexibility stuff gives you is the guidance is the focus on process, not outcome, not attainment. I like that word attainment. Mm -hmm. attainment is really yeah of course you attain things if you're doing things but if you just grasp at attainment uh you're 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 finding a new way to harm yourself turns out that like on emotions avoiding emotions is really really horrible here's here's the next thing that's next most horrible clinging to emotions yeah new data showing that Clinging to positive emotions is as toxic as avoiding negative ones. Why? Because it means you're blocking off everything else. Like if I'm going to ha- hold on, if I'm going to try to fix in place joy, let's say, mm-hmm. well, what's going to happen when I get the call and, you know, my mother's on her deathbed? Mm-hmm. Joy is not the way you're going to describe that. I mean, there is something spiritual and you know holy something about meaningful it. about it but something it's not meaningful joy. about it, but it's not joyful yeah. it's not and so uh you know being open is what life's asking you to do that's not wallowing we're not talking about wallowing we're talking about learning and being being present and learning from the past so that you can care and move towards and things will be attained but if you grab onto them you hold on to them you say oh this precious little thing like let's say you've had a wonderful wonderful experience with another person in a relationship and you and now you, for some reason that's not possible with this person but maybe or maybe it is but not, that same moment isn't there so we're going to have to find that other precious thing that was like that and here's what you do oh yeah this is pretty good but it's not like that Oh, that night, that night, that was so wonderful. They had, okay, now you got like this little diamond in a box. You're going, oh, look at it. Look at it, so wonderful. And everything is being evaluated relative to it. And guess what? That process is not a diamond in the box and will never give you a diamond in the box. That process is going to give you a turd in the box. I mean, it, it is taking life out of... Yeah, life. like you use, uh, you have a metaf- metaphor that... I mean, I've heard you say it out, out loud in different speeches, but it's also in a book. Um, I, I forget the title of it, Act Metaphors. There's a whole book full of Act Oh, metaphors. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and it's the brownie and the and the apple analogy of just like, like, like if your favorite dessert in the whole world was this delicate, like delectable, chewy, chocolatey, rich brownie, and then you're judging everything else by that, and maybe someone's like, hey, do you want an apple? And you taste this apple expecting a brownie, you're going to hate the apple because the apple's kind of tart and crunchy it's not gooey like it's it's bright and crisp not not decadent and rich and and you would hate it but if you weren't having a brownie in your mind and you just someone handed you an apple you'd find hey that's kind of refreshing like that crispness is actually kind of nice and there's something satisfying about getting all the way around an apple and (laughs) taking that last bite and and it's something good in and of itself expectations and disconfirmed expectations and how pain uh, how that dominates us you know because our mind is structuring i want it this way this way this way this way shut up dude come on let's just see what shows up that's bungee jump yeah and that's the awareness is like it's not demanding that the present look like blank and not demanding that i perform like blank but there's this but the commitment would be rather to these values that I believe makes the world a better place. This honesty of, of not wanting to corrupt the world around me or, or act in a way that it violates those values. It's, yeah. and then that presentness with, with love. And I have to say, well, this, if I can say, maybe listeners will, but this conversation has had a playful quality. We've played, we've moved around. Yeah. There's a kind of coherence to it. It's not chaotic mess. It has been a little bit moving around and stuff, but if we had gone in and say, here's what we're going to do. We're going to cover the six facts that most, you know, <laughs> it would feel like a trudge through an yeah. outline. And, you know, I don't, I'm not saying that this conversation is the way all conversations should have been done. It's the one you structured. 
And it's the one that uh, is this. And if there's anything of value in this, what we just did, it was done kind of that way. And I think it's the same kind of thing. There is a time, of course, if uh, you know you were giving a formal speech, it wouldn't look like this. It would look different. Well, I mean, and I'll even be honest with you. I like, like I revere you so much, and I was crazy nervous going into a conversation talking to the master, you know. And but about like 30 minutes in, there was this ease of just like, even just in my own mind, like be present and and share your thoughts and don't don't worry about his judgments and because a judgment from you would feel crushing but like and so i i I was very like okay here's my well-formulated question let him talk but then like no like show up in this conversation and as that as just even in my own heart just noticing like as i showed up in the conversation as i as i shared a couple of summarizations or thoughts to play with the conversation felt way better and and way more present and so i think you're right i think think you know, people are listening and, and wanting to connect or wanting to, you know, produce this thing at work or wanting to create this thing or, you know, finding a place where that you can be yourself and where you can learn, you can be whole and free, learning from your history, but not dominated by it. Mm. You know, that's a tricky set of things to do. It's fortunately not that many things that you need to learn. It's not that many pivots. I got that down to six. Maybe there's a more, but at least those six are pretty well nailed in the science of it. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, let me know which other pivots you find. But uh, <laughs> let's start with these that have several hundred studies behind them mm-hmm. and see where it takes you, see where life takes you, see where your ability, your caring, your love, your values takes you. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know if there's enough love in the world to solve all the world's problems, but I don't know if there's enough values and caring in the world to do that, but I sure would like to find out. And the only way that we can find out is if we can empower each other to be more whole and free, to be who we fully are meant to be. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, when we're wrapped around suffering, it's pretty obvious that's not that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well said. Well, it feels like a good place to stop. Yeah. Mm, thank you so much for coming on. I, I hope this isn't the last time we talk. This was just wonderful. Thank you. It was awesome. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, sir. <laughs>